All right, welcome everyone. This is David Morgan of the MorganReport.com. And this really is an interview, it's a conversation. Uh, John Sneeson, Sneeson, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. John, <laughs> known each other for years. I'm terrible on names. <laughs> but uh, thanks for joining me. And we're just going to have a talk about, uh, you know, the present day economic system. John, uh, what's the name of your, uh, your website or your... Uh, yeah, you can you can find everything about me at uh, theeconomictruth.com, of course. That's where I have uh, everything. Uh, you could find my books there, uh, The End of Freedom, How Our Monetary System Enslaves Us, or Canada, The Greatest Economy in the World, question mark, uh, which is uh, you know a, a book that I wrote in 2016 before Trudeau got in and destroyed <laughs> everything. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you can find everything there, my blogs, you can find my Telegram. I, I do post, um, for those that are interested, I do post like news articles that I found very useful and, and that I look at uh, myself onto my Telegram on a daily basis. So, uh, uh, but you can find all that at theeconomictruth.org, uh, my website. Great. Yeah. Well, we had a bit of a chat before we started the recording and uh, I think so just to review the basics, and this is one of several things that people have a hard time even believing. You know, one is, and everyone is probably tuned into our channel knows this as a fact, and that is that, you know, the, the, the system is set up where the bankers can create something for nothing. They can create money out of thin air. And, you know, as a finance student years ago, most people that were in the class with me when that was taught to us, you know, they just drop their jaw in amazement. No, I mean, that, that can't be true, and it is. The other part that I want to stress is that you don't own your own money. And that is, I think, what where we want to start this discussion today, because yeah. there's been two things. One, I did an interview with uh, Stansbury Research. I guess it's been about two years. And I talked about the bail-ins and the fact that the bank considers any depositor to be a non-secured creditor and once you deposit your money in their bank, it's their money, not yours. That's a fact. Now, that's something that a lot of people that have followed us may not have heard or heard it once and kind of blow it off. Well, that can't be true. I signed a signature card and, you know, that's my money. No, it's actually theirs. And that's been proven. Uh, Trudeau was one of the best to show you in Canada with the trucker strike that he confiscated uh, accounts of uh, the people that were uh, politically incorrect. I'll put it in those terms. Yeah. So coming back to this. Uh, there's been a book that's written that's hitting uh, our circles rather hard called The Takings by, I believe it's David Rogers Webb, David Webb. And he talks about the DTCC. And basically, not only do you not own your money in the bank, but you really don't own your shares in, uh, in a, a brokerage account. It's actually held in the street name. And uh, that book is scary. Basically, what he said uh, is that you don't own anything. The idea that uh, what the WEF has said, you'll own nothing and be happy. <laughs> Actually, the, the legal framework for that yeah. exists today. So can you comment on that and go any direction you'd like, John? Yeah, no, for sure. That It's pretty scary because uh, I, I remember, I think it was like two, three years ago, I started to look at, and I actually was, I forgot who introduced me. I, I think it was... Uh, I got introduced it to uh, with a friend of mine called Tim Pichot. He's uh, called Liberty Advisor. He's a uh, financial advisor that I did uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, shows with called uh, the Tim and John show. We did, uh, I think, like 80 episodes starting actually right at the repo crisis. <laughs> That's, that was our first episode. Uh, and uh, so we kind of like focused on different things like that. And then we found out, uh, I forgot her name. Oh, Whitney Webb uh, was it that introduced us to, you know, the, the TCC, uh, the Depositor Trust and, and uh, um, oh, Trust. Uh, yeah, cor corporation, the DTCC. Anyways, what they do is actually they they hold everything. They have all the stock certificates and everything uh, at their disposal. And they're well, also what's called a central clearing party. Okay, so central clearing parties, there's multiple of them around the world. And the DTCC is the American one. Now there's ones in Europe that are called, uh, I, I forgot where they, like, uh, I could probably like find a document where they're all listed anyways. But uh, um in this FSB report, the financial stability report that I read upon, they talk about the central clearing parties and risks sur uh, surrounding them and so on. Uh, but in there, you know, it becomes pretty apparent that they hold all these uh, certificates or whatever they have and they control, you know, 
what they do is that they make them available for trading for you know the New York Stock Exchange and then also for all the banks through their trading accounts that they have, right? And so <clears throat> they are the ones actually running the back infrastructure for these banks. When when the trade happens, when I sell a stock and you buy it, you know that uh, that exchange is then being done on a ledger that is run by a system that the DTCC then you know swap around the street name titles uh, of you know who has you know the ability to uh, you know uh, be able to receive the dividend and uh, receive you know the profit you know all of us or, or or loss on that stock or share that have been bought or ETF whatever uh, type of uh, asset it is and and they also like every uh, derivative assets that's out there they they also hold titles too and uh, and then they, they divert that to the the global banking system and so basically a gigantic trust that owns all this and they control uh, you know, the, the actual intrinsic title onto this, like they hold the title uh, onto those uh, assets. And then they give us, uh, and the banks even, like not even the banks really hold a proper title to them. Like they, they hold them in our name. I, I think they might hold the physical title. Don't quote me on it, but you know, the actual, you know, RBC or Bank of America, Citibank or whoever owns a title on a share for you in your behalf or if it's BlackRock, whatever it is. Uh, I think they might have title to it, but I, I, you know, maybe they don't even have title to it. You know, the big uh, banks, maybe uh, it's like not to become too conspiratorial there, but maybe it's, you know, the, the way that, you know, they're talking to us, the elites, you know, the world economic forum, Klaus Schwab's, you know, like you own nothing and be happy uh, kind of scenario. Maybe they, they have a little bit of understanding of what's going on there. Uh, of course, uh, in in the global banking system, but who knows who actually like uh, who owns shares? Uh, by the way, in the depository trust corporation, the DTCC, like who actually owns shares for that? Because it is a corporation, right? So, uh, who actually owns uh, their shares again? Uh, like, is it the bankers? You know, the, the, that's a, probably a good valid questions that maybe it's a, if somebody's really smart and have a lot of good connections, maybe they'd be able to cough up uh, you know some shareholder information. <laughs> on the DTCC itself, but it would be it'd be very uh, interesting to see, anyways, because um, <clears throat> when it comes down to it, then what I focus on a lot is you got to be uh, off the grid, you know, financially and uh, you know with your uh, own belongings. Like if if you own anything, if you owe anything in debt towards any of your assets, you know, it's easy for them to just swoop in and then take. And actually, what they'll do is they'll like recall your loan, and then you're gonna have to pay it. Well, if you don't have the money, they're gonna take possession of your asset, right? So uh, there's there's a lot of that, I think, uh, potentially common in David Webb's book. You know, I haven't read it myself, but I've um, got a good uh, uh, um, overview over it from uh, Matthew Smith and uh, Doug Casey on it. And they really, you know, gone into great detail of what happened during the Great Depression. It was a lot of wealth confiscation where you actually, people found out that they don't own their assets. They own, don't own their sh uh, shares. They don't own... You know, there uh, the, if they had like there wasn't ETFs at the time in uh, uh, in the way that we have now, uh, but people found out that their wealth got confiscated. You know, it, if if it was held in you know uh, in um, in your uh, security deposit box at the bank, you know, they could go in there. That happened actually just recently during the bail-ins uh, uh, over in Cyprus, but uh, I think mostly in in Greece actually they went into people's ba uh, like bank deposit. Uh, boxes because you don't even have rights to that. Uh, yeah. If you if you thought that you actually had rights to it, well, you lend it to the bank. That's that's kind of a matter of fact. Same with your, of course, your like your deposits that you have in your bank account. That's not yours. You you just lend it to the bank unless you have it in physical cash and not even cash today. Like they could just evaporate that into nothingness. So uh, you really don't have a lot of things to protect yourself. But you know, through all history. We've been taught, you know, many times through failures and tribulations, both banking and, and in monetary systems, we've been, you know, taught some good lessons on, you know, what probably is the best protection that you could have. And that, you know, most of the time that is real things, you know, the, that's your food, that's your uh, house if you own it uh, outright. Now, problem today, if you pay a, a property tax, you don't own your house. <laughs> the it's government right. owns your house. So, um, but try to own things that, you know, are real, that, uh, that is not, you know, based upon any, 
uh, way that they could manipulate it or just swoop in and then take it, especially if it's anything electronic, it's very risky. It's highly risky. They could, uh, if they get crazy enough, they could just shut off the internet even. So uh, even uh, if if you did have, you know, uh, crypto assets and all that, like it's it's even risky as that. So like, I, I do like crypto. I know that you, you might not be a big fan, Dave, but uh, one of the biggest things is like uh, looking at crypto. I, I still like my massive by far biggest holding is in precious metals because it's the safest and securest uh, that you can have. Like, yeah, you could come and try to rob it from me, but you probably uh, feel pretty miserable trying to do it. <laughs> it's, it's fun. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a, I, I think we're coming to a, uh, to fruition uh, in, in probably most of like, it looks like because there's a lot of uh, countries around the world that are facing massive uh, debt problems right now. And it comes to like uh, the, the debt issues that we had around the world. Like I was just looking at a report from the Financial Stability Board and they now include non-bank financial in, uh, entities. Uh, and they found out that we're sitting at around in the G5, we're sitting at close to 500% debt to GDP. You know, it's a, it's just uh, unheard of, uh, and and of course, you know, the, when, but the thing is, we live in a debt based system, and it's it's a Ponzi scheme. So think about this: when uh, if you replace the investors that's coming in at the bottom uh, of the Ponzi scheme with debtors, you know, then you get actually like a full insight in how our monetary system works quite quickly, because when you lose, uh, when debtors uh, default, and when they can't pay anymore. Uh, actually, that's really, really, really bad for the monetary system, uh, and it can't survive with uh, actually going into negative called deflation. And so, uh, if that happens, and we're starting to see that now, we're starting to see M2 in the United States has gone negative. And and when was the last time that happened? That was during the Great Depression. Great Depression. Uh, and and what what happened then? That's exactly what we've been talking about, right? So. There's some huge, huge warning signs. And of course, in a debt-based monetary system that we have, you can't have shrinking debt uh, like monetary levels. And you can, you have to constantly issue more and more and more debt to pay off the ever-increasing debt and interest. So you outlined a little bit about how much of, a, I'll call it for lack of a better term, haircut uh, the bond markets have taken because of increase in interest rates. Can you just go over that briefly? And then after you answer, you know, the kind of uh, discount you would have to sell the 30 year for to, uh, you know, raise cash. Could you then from there move on to what do you think is going to happen to the bond market? Do you think that there could be a default even at the long end of the curve? Or do you think they'll just keep printing money? You know, to, I'll answer the question. I want your comment. To Perfect. me, there's really two scenarios. One is you do a default. So you mark the, you, you, you do anything that you do in real life. You mark to market. In other words, this asset, be it a debt instrument or not, I got a bunch of dresses that no one wants to buy. So I just keep marking them down until they sell in my dress shop. Well, the same thing in the monetary sphere. I just keep marking the bond down until someone wants to buy it. The problem is, <laughs> you know, that 500 to one is a real problem. But coming back on point, there's a way to make it solvent, and that is to flush out the system. The other part is what's most likely, at least in advanced economies throughout all of history, and that is you just print. You make the interest payment on that debt, but then the worth, the currency becomes worthless, and yeah. no one trusts it. Now you really got a problem because now you've got to do the reset and start over, which, of course, in the behind the scenes, we all think that the bankers have this master plan to push the reset button and put us on a CBDC or, or a different platform. So I said a lot, but where's the bond market at now? Where do you think it could go? Do you think either one of those scenarios could take place or have you got a different perspective? Well, the bond market is in huge distress. I, you know, the <clears throat> there's only been a few times throughout history, actually, when bonds and stocks have lost at the same time. And that was, I think the first time was right during, before the Great Depression. It was the first time. And then I think it was in the 60s, uh, right before the 1971 reset. And so I, I think we're heading towards a reset because uh, both uh, stocks and bonds are down still. Like the stocks are still not above there. You know, 22, was it 2021 or 22 high, right? Still, so they're not uh, seeming to be able to recover. And we, we have a huge... Um, 
a deflationary pressure, uh, you know, it's um, uh, especially through the demographics that we have as well. You know, Harry Dent is a fantastic demographer and he's kind of talked about this. But where I think he is wrong is that uh, he he thinks that, you know, the, the, we're just going to let it go. <laughs> and I, I just don't think because there's a speech done by uh, none other than Ben Bernanke in 2002 before he was a uh, like a governor of the Federal Reserve. And in that speech, he actually wrote that, you know, that if we do get deflation, we could only uh, comfort ourselves that we always have the uh, uh the comfort blanket base uh, that's not the exact quote but the comfort blanket of uh the printing presses to protect ourselves so basically what he said is that they will buy assets they will purchase everything uh and and i i think they're gonna you know during covid i i looked at all the central banks in the world and what i found was that uh there's lots of them that had to go and buy stocks they bought etfs even Several of them, like the Norwegian Central Bank, Norges Bank, uh, bought 4% of Oslo Börs, which is the Norwegian stock exchange. And so they had to go there and bail them out, basically, in order to, uh, you know, control a uh, complete failure. Because what ends up happening, and this system is based upon trust, is that if that trust link breaks, it goes south very fast. Like, this is why I have a wall behind me with uh, hyperinflationary currencies. You know, I collect uh, hyperinflationary currencies and I have like 30 of them in here. And, and that's what, what happens is that the link of trust breaks for these currencies. And when that breaks, uh, there's no way back for the government to store trust in the value of the currency. So what ends up happening is the people uh, would just start, you know, uh, either trying to get rid of as much as they can at a fast pace. So you get what's called velocity kicks up. And then what ends up happening is you get a massive supply. So we got supply and demand. They get a massive supply of currency coming and chasing, you know, one to buy real things. And then so then you get the hyperinflationary shocks. And then right after that, you get another shock upon shock. And then it, it basically people are getting rid of whatever they can that are, uh, you know, in the current monetary system. And so you just get a rush out of that. But then what happens is the the and people stop probably using it in transactions. So what ends up happening is the government is not going to be able to collect the taxes. So they have to print. And that's where you get that big print coming from the government uh, to try to rescue them. So that's what happened in Venezuela just recently. So you got a print and then the just like another shock to the currency is completely gone. Like usually that process takes from one to six months. So th that's just a historical scheme. But l let's go and look at like I have a list here and I got to give a big shout out to um, a guy that I follow on LinkedIn. Uh, his name is Rebel Cole. He's um Lynn Eminent Scholar Chaired Professor uh, of Finance. Uh, and so <clears throat> he actually recently came out with a list of over 77 banks. Uh, and, and he looked at, you know, their balance sheets and, and how much losses they have on different, like, so he, he categorized it into four different categories. And the one is uh, percentage loss on government securities, then uh, residential mortgage-backed securities, then commercial mortgage-backed securities. Then they looked at what's called asset-backed securities. So asset-backed securities are just securitized uh, uh, student loans, credit cards, car loans, and, and so on. Like that's asset-backed securities. So it's the same as a mortgage-backed security, but it, the debt is uh, just different. It's consumer goods, right? So, but if we go and look at some of these banks, and and we should look at probably the, the bigger one, you know, uh, uh, that's on here, which is, of course, um, it's a bank that's, you know, a primary bank. It's one of the major banks in, in the United States is Bank of America. Now, their losses on his sheet here uh, estimate right now, you know, like it's not, of course, you talked about the mark to market, right? And uh, if you mark to market, you know, their actual balance sheet, they'll have a loss of $108.853 billion right now. Uh, and where their biggest amount of losses come from, uh, it's uh, actually 80, they lost 80.3% on their residential mortgage-backed securities. So this is housing in the United States. Let me stop you, John. I have to make a joke. I hate interrupting. Yeah, of course. Real estate only goes up. What are you talking about? Oh, shoot. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one here in Manitoba, where I'm from. You know, in the capital city, they had... Uh, uh, like think 30 years of up 
you know, just up and up and up. And then they had two years where they lost minus 2%. And then like everything has been up. So everybody, yeah, like real estate will always goes up. Like I hear this from just the reason I listened to a real estate, a Remax broker from Toronto. He was talking about how, you know, like yes, they have 7% loss now, uh, like of the sales, 7% of the sales are in lost territory now in Toronto itself and so he's like well there's nothing to really worry about for the future you know like if you buy you know and hold for the future it's all good and this comes back to again like yeah let me just sidestep for a second because i always have talked to so many financial advisors around you know especially mostly in 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 the vicinity here in manitoba and all of them are like well you invest for a long term you know that's how we get wealthy and rich but then I ask one question, ask, ask your financial advisor a simple question. And that is, you know, what happens if we uh, do get a big recession or a depression that happens uh, when you're about to retire? What's going to happen to my portfolio? Because now you're retiring, you have to withdraw at the same time as you lose it massively. <laughs> and so like the, the, the accumulated losses, you know, in your portfolio would be massive on that, right? So that this is not a good uh, scenario that we're in. And, and we're going to see that with uh, this bank list because... Of course, Bank of America is one, but there's like 77. These are uh, some of the bigger banks. Uh, and there's 77, uh, you know, all these banks that have heavy losses. Like uh, there's been a lot of talks about Cla Charles Schwab, you know, bank. Uh, and their losses are $23.5 billion. Now, their biggest loss comes from um, uh, real estate mortgage-backed securities again uh, with 66.3%. Now, here comes another surprise that might surprise people a lot, which is this this is interesting, right? Like uh uh okay, so they got some losses here, but uh what about bonds? You know, bonds should be the most securest thing in the world, like we should never uh you know, that's where everybody floods to for security, right? Well, right. so okay, so what ha what happened with a lot of these banks during, you know, uh COVID, uh well the government lockdowns, we shouldn't call it COVID even. During the government lockdowns, what ended up happening is that the government sent out mass amounts of stimulus and these banks, they had to then, because as a bank, you need an asset and liability. The liability is the borrowed money, the deposit in your bank account. The asset then they would have to have to cover it would be a uh, bond. And so they bought, a lot of them bought long, uh, you know, like there, I think 30 year bonds that were issued at zero per, near 0%. And then now, you know, they're looking at like, oh, what if I sell it now? Well, now, you know, what is the, let's say 10 year right now is 4.8 something, 4.7. I forgot exactly where it's sitting right now. Uh, so you get a massive, massive loss uh, on that. And and there's banks here, like Citizens Bank uh, sits on 97.0% loss on their bond, uh, bond portfolio. Uh, there's uh, a Union County Savings Bank. They have 93.2 percent loss uh, on their uh, on their bond holdings. Uh, you got CBNS Bank uh, that they have 98 percent loss on their bond portfolio. Uh, you have uh, let's see if we can find like here. So just some other ones. You know, let's see if we can find any bigger uh, banks on there. Um, uh, farmers, uh, farmers National Bank, fifty-one percent loss on their bond portfolio. But if you go and look at actually the uh, uh, the commercial side, so the commercial mortgage-backed securities, there's one bank that is in big trouble, and that's the Green County Commercial Bank. They have fifty point three percent loss on their uh, bond portfolio. They're they're a New York bank. Um, but if you look at the total losses, this is interesting because it now their leverage gets exposed, uh, uh, David. And and as you can see, here, so if we go by the banks, so these banks are actually ranked uh, from number one with the biggest amount of, of losses on their CET1 capital, right? And so like now it becomes apparent that they have leverage because, uh, you know, first, um, you know, Republic First uh, Bank, has 143.4% loss. Uh, you got the First American Trust uh, has 125.3% loss. You got Citizen Bank has 124.2%. Uh, Principal Bank, um, they have 1145 You got um, Union Savings Bank, 110.9% loss. Uh, you got Green Dot Bank, uh, 109%. And like the list goes on and on. I'll, I'll share it with you so you could share it with your 
uh, with your readers. But uh, again, it becomes pretty apparent that like anything that's debt based, um, that is also like, of course, all the derivatives uh, that are dependent on, you know, certain um, interest rates and so on to be a, leg a legitimate investment. And then, of course, when uh, when the uh, when the, the investors dry up uh, in these derivatives and they're like they can't pay, you know, the the um, um uh, the the people that actually are the underlying debt on this you know the people that drive their cars that have their houses and so on they can't pay their debt because of high interest rates well now we're going to have a cascading uh, massive failure of these assets uh one thing that was very interesting i i in, interviewed recently david a lady that used to be a she used to be a specialized uh journalist in mortgage-backed securities mm -hmm. and, and collateralized debt obligations from 2005 to 2008 uh, and uh, it was very interesting. Her name is Alison Pyburn. And, and um, she was telling me, you know, that her friends that used to be journalists with her, uh, they're all either they're sitting at high bank positions right now, or they ended up at the rating agencies uh, and got some good pa high paying jobs. So she's one of the few <laughs> that are left that actually, you know, have a conscience uh, among these people. But she was telling me like, so how it works in the derivatives world is you start with good, de good debt. You know, and you collateralize that into these derivatives. And then you keep on like, so the collateralize because they want more and more of these uh, derivatives. Well, now we go collateralize more and more debt. So you keep on like going down the chain and down the ratings of, you know, uh, good debt to really bad debt. And so at the end of a cycle, you, they take all the garbage basically like that they know is useless and then they have to collateralize that as well and that ends up on you know balance sheets and i remember 2008 where uh, norwegian pension funds for uh, uh, the local uh, counties in norway uh, they ended bankrupt and they're uh, like they uh, still are in you know trying to get their money back from the funds in in the united states that sold it to them and so all this collateral, all these debt, and, and of course, like the derivatives that are in the quadrillions on top of everything, right? Um, uh, like all of this stuff is just a massive uh, inflated balloon that is ready to pop. And um, it's it's going to be quite the ride because people are going to realize, first of all, that their assets are worthless. But second of all, uh, that, you know, their assets that might have some value might be just confiscated you know, during this process of reset. And so it's very, it's going to be a very uh, interesting and very risky, uh, you know, um, period that's ahead of us. And I think it's coming very soon because like the, the, the mortgage markets in the United States have completely stalled. Nobody wants to buy or sell anymore in the United States or oh, there, there's people that does it, but there's a lot, lot less because uh, they don't want to take on an 8%, you know, the mortgage because they can't afford it. <laughs> it's very simple and that's what you're starting to see a lot of other places especially in the big big cities where you know uh, there's lots of money and then of uh, when it's lots of money chasing assets you know you get very high prices so it, it's just a uh, loose loose scenario right now and and then of course i remember back in 2020 during covid like during the government lockdowns you had tip mcclem the the head of the central bank of canada now he came out and said to the population this is how insane the central banker is you know comes out and says that oh don't worry you know go out and lend as much as you can don't worry we're going to hold the interest rates at zero until the end of 2023 well now it's up at five percent almost <laughs> <laughs> and now we came out and said that, oh, we got to wa watch about, you know, uh, we got some risks going on. But he was the one that came out and then told the people, you know, like, let's go out on a debt bench, you know, at the worst possible time. And then, of course, uh, what uh, they thought that, oh, uh, you know, the uh, it's transitory, the, the inflation, you know, by printing, yeah, right. creating a whole bunch of currency and shoving it into the economy and, and thinking that that's going to be transitory. It's taken a long, long time for that to come through. And what people also got to understand is like, oh, that inflation went away? No, it's like, no, there's still like three, four, five, six, ten percent 10% that it's still accumulating annually uh, yeah. that you're losing. And so people don't understand, seem to understand that, you know, that, uh, yeah, inflation year over year went down, but you still have lost all of that inflation throughout the time because inflation hasn't gone negative. So you lost a tremendous amount of purchasing power. Yeah, there's so many vectors I could go with on this, John. Um, and I'm making some notes, but let me go here. This is one that I don't think gets enough um, 
discussion. And, uh, you know, you can shoot holes in anything I say, if you'd like. I mean, that's, you know, I'm very free market and free speech oriented, as you well know. But I think one aspect about inflation that most people don't take into account, especially the, the mainstream financial press, is the psychology of inflation. So let me explain it a bit. So I just put up on my Twitter account, I think it was this week, that the UAW, the United Auto Workers, were given a 25% wage increase. 25%, that's a freaking healthy wage increase. <laughs> now, here's my make-believe scenario. So I'm an auto worker. I got a 25% wage increase. I feel good. Inflation by the government's standards are only 8% here in the U.S., which is probably more like double that, according to John Williams, shadowstats.com. But I'll come back. We use our 8%. So I feel pretty good. I'm covered, my family, you know. But here's the problem. The plumber goes to the United Auto Worker and um, he sees that this guy's got a 25% increase in wages. So he says, you know what? In my plumbing business, I'm going to go to 30% increase because I got to stay even with the United Auto Worker. I mean, after all, I got to feed my family and inflation is whatever it said, but I, he got 25%. So I'm going to 30%. Now, the auto mechanic <clears throat> that gets um, work done on his car. Uh, or does work on somebody's car, says, you know what? I can't afford uh, these cheap wages I'm paying myself. I've got to increase 40% because last time I got the plumber in here, it was a 30% increase on me and I got to be able to pay my bill. So there's, an, it, I probably did a rather corny example, but this gets this psychology. And the reason I could say it was some authority is I lived it because when I got out of school, I was 22 years old. This cost of living allowance was across the board in all the major corporations. If you were an auto worker, an aircraft worker, worked at 3M, Dow Chemical, any of the large, you know, huge corps that had, you know, massive corporate debt and could borrow, uh, they were giving their employees uh, wage increases all the time to keep them even with inflation. So it becomes a psychological event as much as anything else, according to me. What say you? No, I, I totally agree. And, uh, uh, you know, I described how hyperinflationists could start. And a lot of times that's a psychological event. It's when people lose the trust in the currency. And, uh, and of course, when like I see this everywhere here in, in our province, too, like we have massive strikes that's been going on. And, and especially in the government sector, you know, people are getting like 13, 14, 15 percent raises over uh, one to two, uh, three period year period. Uh, of course, like what we don't understand is like it actually is to try to keep up with inflation but now the inflation that you get from the cpi you know and that we're watching is very uh manipulated and so that's kind of why i believe it's manipulated is to try to keep that down but of course the psychology would be that everybody wants a race of course like why wouldn't it make sense that i would have more because i've lost so much of my purchasing power i'm struggling to make ends meet why wouldn't I want, uh, you know, a lot more in salary to make my life, uh, you know, okay to live again? Uh, and so, uh, you know, you might have that, but then if you have the person that has, you know, good amount of money and then get a raise, you know, they might buy a bigger home. And then, like, you get that cycle. So, you could, you know, get some trickling of that, uh, um, you know, psychological inflationary pressures that are coming out there from, from those, uh, you know, you know uh, heights. And then, of course, I, I remember, you know, that. so I, I purchased a lot of alarm parts and, and cameras and so on. And that's supposed to be a very deflationary sector, okay? Like I, you know, it's supposed to be very deflationary. Uh, now, those prices uh, went up during uh, 2021 to 2022, and they still have gone up. They've actually gone up about 100%, okay? So, mm -hmm. like, see, the real inflation is down here now. What's going to end up happening as me as a business, I'm going to go out and then when I do a quote for a customer, I'm not going to quote the old price you know, from two years ago. I'm going to quote you a new price because or else I'm losing. I'm kick, kick it, like I'm draining my balance sheet, uh, it, you know, my uh, bottom line because I, I would not be smart enough to follow the new pricing. And then um, uh, I looked at uh, one base metal that I use a lot, which is copper, you know, for both electrical and and uh, for my uh, network cabling and all that, like that has gone up uh, almost 120%. A and and uh, what we've seen is it went up and then it went down. 
but guess what? It went down, like it went up a hundred percent, came down two percent, and then went up another twenty percent. And so, what is happening also is that we got to remember it's not only that, but it's also the labor that goes into creating these things, right? And so that's right. where it comes back to that we can uh, uh, yet another again see more price rises. And I'll, I of course keep my eye on this on a monthly basis. You know, my prices are for my uh, customers when I do quotes and so on. And so you see a lot of um, uh, that psychology is really trickling in. And you, you saw that even at my business, I didn't even ask for a raise, but the boss actually have given us several raises without like me even thinking of it. <laughs> so um, it's psychological because they know that if they don't give a raise, oh, maybe it would just jump to somewhere else that they have higher, uh, you know, wages or something like that. But what's going to end up happening is, when you have all that inflationary pressure uh, on there, yeah, you get more money and all these uh, things. It's all fun and games for for a little while, but then prices rise again, and and then if if inflation goes up again, you know, you, this could be a triple top inflation like you had in the seventies, right? And so if you get the if we're in that, you know, we're down now, we're deflating a bit, but then all the wages and all these pressures come back again. You know, what you could have is you could have another inflationary pressure that comes in that's even higher and then what happens is that you will have a lot of uh people panicking because what's going to happen is the central banks they're going to be desperate they're going to have to raise the interest rates like they did they didn't want to but they had to and so they're going to raise interest rates to potentially higher levels again uh, and then so what's going to happen with that is that you'll get a uh you know a uh, huge pressure again and then you're in the same boat again and so you have this cycle and it could happen within years now, you know, this cycle where you have these panics. And and at one point, uh, what's going to end up happening is it goes too far where people have uh, had their purchasing power destroyed too much and their salaries. Like in Venezuela, this is an interesting point to your salary point there, uh, Dave, is in Venezuela at one point, I remember reading about five to 10,000% increase in, 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 in a salary raises. But at one point, this woman that worked for the government, she actually quit her government job, high-paying government job in Venezuela. She went on the street to sell coffee and made 10 times more. And so that's where you get those massive shocks. Um, that that could be a potential outcome here, is that if you don't get the deflationary outcome, you then get the, the, you know, the, uh, the spiking of inflation to higher and higher levels. Uh, you could definitely have, you know, the outcomes. And then, uh, of course, what will end up happening is that uh, people that are have their savings and everything in, you know, the uh, the currency, uh, it's just losing more and more without having any clue what's going on. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, even though we have an inflationary pressure and everybody seems to feel like that you're richer, you actually get poorer and poorer and poorer. Well, I've got one more question. i got to wrap it up, but... Yeah. Um... This is uh, one I get often, and I've changed my opinion on it. <clears throat> uh, very practical. So do you think it is worth taking your stock certificates in printed form in your name and mailed to you so you actually have possession of that piece of paper? I've told my people no. I used to advocate that. In fact, when I started in the stock market early on, every mining company I own, I had that piece of paper in my hand. But those days are long gone. and and. If, if you take the certificate, you have to sign the back and mail it back to your broker or your bank, and then they have to put it back in the electronic system before you can sell it. Mm -hmm. And so if the system mucks up, you um, it's an extra chore, an extra burden. I mean, what if the mail postal department's on strike? I mean, so many things could go wrong. I think it's better to keep it in street name which you're the beneficiary of it and you can mouse click it off. What do you think? No, I, I think exactly like when it comes to those type of assets and I have, I have mining stocks and, and uh, stocks in the, um, uh, the um, commodity sector. I, yeah, no, I, I would just keep them there. Yeah. I know that they could potentially be a loss. You know, you got to understand that that could be a huge risk of course, but yeah, just, just may, uh, make sure that that's a risk that you have you know, that you're willing to take uh, and that, um, you know, if, if things goes really well, you know, we might uh, we might be fair mongering and, and it's a wonderful world in two, three years, but <laughs> I don't think so. But again, you know, it's um, 
I, I think it's better to just take those risks and have that there. And uh, like, that's what I do anyways. And I th think that's what uh, actually even Doug Casey does it uh, himself. I've said it. So uh, yeah. And like, there's no point of trying to even get there. And, and can you even get a stock certificate uh, these days? Very difficult. Very. Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah, because like who owns the stock certificate most right. likely is the DTCC or whoever exactly. clearing a clearing house that you know sits on these, and so yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, that's I, I don't think that's even worth it, you know, to go through all that trouble to uh to try to think that you own an asset. Now, if you actually were able to uh you know trade uh, uh with uh, corporations that are private, you know, that are private and and are not on stock exchanges. You know, if they were outside and you could hold a direct, you know, share in, in the corporation, if they did, you know, paper copies and you could have a direct, you know, connection, that's a little different. But, you know, and uh, I, yeah, I, I, for anything that's traded on any exchanges that are, you know, held in that street name, it's, yeah, it's pretty much useless, I think, to try to, uh, you know, get to the point where you hold anything um, in paper form. I, I think that's pretty much a zero. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close it out there, John. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, but thank you so much to... for your time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a pleasure, Dave, and uh, I look forward to chatting with you further in the future. Very good. Take care yeah. now. Yeah, have a good one.